we start to see the outlines of the way a path of karma yoga might work and how we might bring it into our own lives. We see the possibility that we can turn whatever it is we do every day into a path to God. Krishna has given Arjuna, given us, two instructions so far about how to go about doing that. First, he said we listen to hear what our dharma is, and we try to become harmonious with that in our actions. Next, we perform each act as purely as we can, without thinking about any rewards. But there is one more key instruction in this practice of karma yoga, and it's the one that flips the game out to another level. Not only do you do your dharma and act without regard to its fruits, in addition to all that, you act without thinking of yourself as being the actor. The action is happening through you, but you aren't doing it. You have stepped out of the way. That puts you in a whole new perspective in relation to your actions. Krishna tells Arjuna, All actions take place in time by the interweaving of the forces of nature, the gunas, but the man lost in selfish delusion thinks that he himself is the actor. Krishna is saying, Look, you're not doing anything. It's a delusion to imagine you are. You're not the actor. What's happening is just the sum total of millions of laws playing themselves out through you. Once you see that, really see that, you're home free, because your sense of I acting in the world is stripped away. So the karma yogi is the person who uses his or her life to come to God by listening for the dharmic act, acting without attachment to the outcome, all the while knowing she or he's not the actor anyway. That's the whole formula for turning our lives around and making them our spiritual practice. The warrior in the Carlos Castaneda books gives us another model of the perfect karma yogi. All the things Don Juan says about the warrior refer to the karma yogi as well. A warrior is a hunter. He calculates everything. That's control. But once his calculations are over, he acts, he lets go and he survives in the best of all possible fashions. The mood of a warrior calls for control over himself, and at the same time it calls for abandoning himself. We can hear in that a description of some of the qualities that come into our actions when we're not attached to the outcome and not busy being the actors. There's a sense of equanimity, for example. Castaneda talks about it as a sense of control yet self-surrender. There's great spontaneity and at the same time a quality of loving attention because each act is our offering, our flower at God's feet. If we're acting from that place, it shows up in each thing we do, even simple things like making a cup of tea. Gurdjieff used to say, if you can serve a cup of tea properly, you can do anything. That is, if you are able to perform any act in a true karma yogic fashion, it's because you're acting from a place where you're free of attachments and not busy being the actor, and being in that place will shape every act you do. The Book of Tao says, By letting it go, it all gets done. The world is won by those who let it go, but when you try and try, the world is then beyond the winning. If you're going to make a cup of tea right, you can't be busy trying to make the cup of tea right, because while you're busy trying, you're not present with making the tea. You can't be doing both. The right way to make a cup of tea is to start by bringing together everything you need to make the tea, including the knowledge of how to do it. And then you make the tea. While you're making the tea, you're just making the tea, nothing else. You're not worrying about how the tea will turn out, and you're not wondering whether you're good enough to make the tea correctly, and you're not thinking about whether you should serve it with honey. You're just right there making the tea. Now you're rinsing the kettle. Now you're filling it. Now you're putting it on the stove, being present with every step, and acting out of the total harmony of each moment. 
the more purely we flow into our karmic circumstances, the more our acts are just happening. There's no struggle. There's no anxiety because we don't care how the act turns out. There's no self-consciousness because there's no actor involved. He who sees the inaction that is in action and the action that is in inaction is wise indeed. Even when he is engaged in action, he remains poised in the tranquility of the Atman. But we can't fake it. That's just more attachment. We can't pretend we're right there making the tea when we're really not, when really we're lost in the thought of how well we're making the tea. We have to start from where we're at, right in this moment. So here we are. We're still stuck with all our desires. Most of the things we're doing, we're doing because we want something out of it, and we can't make believe we're other than what we are. What do we do? How do we work with our actions as yoga when we know how caught we still are? And most important of all, how do we know for sure what it is we're supposed to do? The answer is, we don't. The truth of it is, until you are no longer attached to your ego in any way, every act you do will have your ego present in it. There's not a chance it won't. Right up to the end, there are going to be mixed motives. Subtle ways in which you'll do it to yourself again and again. That's what's so funny about this battle. I've said before that the span of progress on the spiritual path is about one body length. We take a step and we fall flat on our faces because it was another impure trip. So we pull ourselves up and we take the next step and we fall on our faces again. That seems to be about the rate at which we go. So when you're listening to hear your dharma, there is very little likelihood that you're going to hear the pure message. You're just going to hear another message, but you keep tuning and tuning through study, through meditation, through falling on your face, and slowly, slowly, as your methods start to work, your attachment to the whole business starts to get less and less. After all, the ego can only trap you as long as you think you are it. When it's just out there doing its thing, when it's just egoing, like eyes seeing or ears hearing, it becomes merely a functional entity. Nothing more interesting than that. In the meantime, you do the best you can. You look at the next step you're about to take, and you ask yourself, what seems to be the right next thing to do? Then you become quiet, and you listen inside for an answer. You get as quiet as you can, and you listen as clearly as you can, but you recognize that in spite of that, it's probably not going to be a pure message from beyond the beyond. Very likely, it'll still have plenty of your desire systems mixed in with it. Once you've decided as best you can, you act, keeping in mind that you are not the actor. While you're acting, you don't second-guess yourself. You don't waste your time wondering whether you made the right decision. You're done deciding. Now you're acting. Be present with your actions. After you've finished, if you want to, you can sit back and reflect and say, was that the right choice? That's different. But while you're doing it, do it fully. When you're making tea, make tea. When you're brushing your teeth, brush your teeth. When you're making love, make love. Big acts, small acts, whatever it is, be fully there with it. Stop ruining things for yourself with that self-conscious, judgmental holding back. What we're letting go of in that process is the old self-critical inner voice, the old superego that's so afraid of blowing it, afraid of making a mistake, afraid of looking like a fool. That is not the same, you'll notice, as the impersonal inner witness, the practice of noting what we're experiencing. That's the thing we're trying to cultivate. Witnessing has a totally different quality to it. It's observing, not judging. The judging superego is incompatible with acting in the moment. The impersonal witness is the essence of acting in the moment.
So karma yoga turns out to be a technique for extracting ourselves from the turmoil of life, not by an action, but by shifting perspectives on our actions. No longer are our actions a means to fulfill our desires. Now they are opportunities for spiritual practice, for practice in being unattached to the outcome, and for practice in getting rid of the idea that we're doing anything. We do what we do all the time recognizing that it's just the wheel of karma, the dance of God's play, the laws lawfully unfolding through us. We see that it was only our incredible egocentricity that made us think we were doing it. And as we begin to see ourselves that way, not as the actors, but as the vehicles through which the laws of nature are unfolding, we are approaching something which is much more interesting and much more profound than whatever it was we might have thought the game was about. Krishna points to it when he says, I have no work to do in all the worlds, Arjuna, for these are mine. I have nothing to obtain because I have it all, and yet I work. And yet I work. Isn't that interesting? He's saying, Look, I don't have any karma, there's nothing I have to do but I act anyway. Coming from that space of no ego and no attachment, there clearly has to be a whole different motive for acting. You see, we've really been talking about starting with our desires, starting with our attachments, and using them as a way of coming to union. It's out of our desire to come to the One, out of our desire to be liberated, out of our desire to surrender that we listen to hear our dharma, and that we do it. We do our dharma to fulfill a desire within the desire system. There's an attachment in there, the attachment to getting liberated, and that's what motivates us to work. But if all that is true, then once we get liberated and have no attachments, why would we work? Krishna is letting us in on a whole new basis for action here. Imagine a person who has absolutely no personal desire to do anything, not even to get enlightened. She's got it. She is it. She's not trying to develop herself. She's already there. She has no more moral motives. She's beyond good and evil. So what is she doing, doing anything? Ananda Maima was a beautiful saint in India. Someone who was living in that place, someone whose actions were totally free. Yet she set up hospitals, dispensaries, schools. What was she doing with all those ashrams and all that service? Was she doing karma yoga? Outwardly, her actions might have seemed like that, but the spirit of it, the motive from which she was acting, was completely different. The motive was different in that there was no motive. There was no intention behind her actions. She was just being the expression of Dharma, being compassion. With beings like that, beings like Ananda Maima or my guru, it's that spirit behind their actions which is the transmission. The true guru is someone whose very life is a statement of how it all is when you're done with it all, and any forms or acts that the guru uses are merely the vehicles for that transmission. Such a being is beyond the gunas, beyond the forces of nature, no longer attached at all to body, mind, reason, senses, but using them still. In that place, you're no longer doing karma yoga. You're the expression of it. Meher Baba said, To penetrate into the essence of all being and significance, and to release the fragrance of that inner attainment for the guidance and benefit of others by expressing in the world forms of truth, love, purity, and beauty, this is the sole game which has any intrinsic and absolute worth. All other happenings, incidents, and attainments can, in themselves, have no lasting importance. Yoga has been called a practice for concentrating all our faculties on a single point in order to transcend the limitations of ego. But karma yoga? Who would have suspected that the road to God would lead us by way of the household and the marketplace? 
The world becomes the means for extricating ourselves from the strands of worldly attachment. What an ingenious flip! Instead of entangling us, suddenly our acts set us free. The Gita says, Who in all his work sees God, in truth he goes to God. When we first set out to do our work as spiritual practice, we are still operating from inside the world of attachments and desires, because the desire to get free is still a desire. But as the upaya, the method, begins to work, it leads us to a deeper understanding of the reason and wisdom that underlie the whole system. We see who we are and what it is that's going on in a different light. And along with that understanding comes an increasing impersonality toward our own lives. Impersonality. Not less involvement, but less romanticizing of it all. Less melodrama, less doer. We go on living our lives, and we live them as perfectly as we can, but we live them in an increasingly detached way. Less and less are we acting out of our motives or our desires, not even out of the high-minded ones like enlightenment. We're just acting because it's our dharma to act. That's Essence Karma Yoga.